Okay, it's just almost 12, so why don't I get started with um, the introductions. Um, welcome everyone and Happy New Year. Um, tonight, today we're going to have um, two speakers from the Université de Laval. Uh, Sophie Desroches is an Associate Professor at the School of Nutrition in, at Laval, Researcher at the Institute of Nutrition and Functional Foods at the Population Health and Practice um, Changing Research and at the University of Laval. Her research program aims to secure the conceptual, methodological, and practical basis for identifying and evaluating knowledge translation strategies that will optimize adherence to dietary advice. And joining Sophie is her PhD student, Audrey and Dima. Can you please mute if you're not uh, muted, whoever just joined? Um, and as I said, she's a PhD student under, in nutrition under the supervision of Sophie Desroches at Laval University. And her field of research is the use of social media, more especially healthy eating blogs, to transfer nutrition knowledge, influence eating behaviors, and optimize adherence to dietary advice. And with that, I will remind everyone to please save their questions for the end. We'll go site by site, and any individuals or sites who do have questions, they're also welcome to send them through the chat feature to, to me, um, and I'm listed as the KT moderator. Thank you. Go ahead. So thank you, Gail. Um, you can hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today at to present our research program on uh, using social media to improve dietary behaviors. Um, the learning objectives of the presentation uh, of the presentation are to outline the steps to develop an evidence-informed nutritional uh, intervention using a blog as a KD strategy. Uh, we'll then present the findings uh, from uh, some of our work uh, leading to a randomized controlled trial, uh, which assesses the impact of using a healthy eating blog as a KT strategy on dietary behaviors. Um, and then we'll finish with some uh, future directions that uh, we'd like to take and uh, discuss a little bit about a new project that we uh, started in our team. So the overall goal of my research program is to develop the knowledge base required to improve adherence to dietary advice um, through and KT between dietitians and their patients, uh, but also on a public health level. Um, the first time I presented the KT Canada seminar, I discussed mostly uh, the research access of my program uh, that pertains to shared decision making, so an approach uh, which studies uh, KT but within uh, nutritional consultations. Uh, and today I will discuss uh, mostly uh, the part of my research program looking at social media as a KT strategy that could be used by dietitians uh, to improve dietary behaviors uh, of uh, the population. So as a background, uh, poor diet is one of the most prominent risk factors for obesity and related chronic diseases, and promoting dietary modification is an important public health strategy for preventing chronic diseases. However, uh, adherence to dietary recommendations is quite low. Uh, one of these uh, dietary recommendations that people uh, can admit is the consumption of fruit and vegetables. Uh, so most of our project focuses on this dietary behavior. Uh, first of all, well, because as I said, less than half of uh, the population meets the minimum required uh, portions of fruits and vegetables, and also because it's a food group uh, among which uh, there's no really controversy. Uh, so in nutrition, there is controversy about some, um, some components of the diet, such as cholesterol, dietary fat, but uh, there's no controversy uh, as to uh, the benefits of fruits and vegetables in the diet. Um, in terms of uh, behavior change interventions, uh, there are many barriers for individuals to attend traditional in-person uh, behavior change interventions in nutrition. Uh, some of these barriers pertain to um, work constraints or uh, also uh, about uh, family uh, obligations. Uh, also, people from remote areas cannot always access these uh, intervention, um, traditional in-person interventions. Uh, and behavior change takes 
sometimes. So uh, a lot of people do not benefit from these health promotion uh, and disease prevention uh, interventions. So uh, could social media address some of these barriers? Um, well, in terms of uh, the amount of people, the percentage of people uh, using internet, it's always increasing. In the U.S., it's about 90%. Uh, we have uh, similar statistics for Canada and also the province of Quebec. Um, and also 72% of internet users uh, search online for health-related information. Uh, social media is uh, a group of internet-based applications that people use to uh, access health-related information. Um, it is built on the foundation of Web 2.0, and they allow the creation and exchange of user-generated content. Um, using social media in healthcare is increasing uh, rapidly. Um, in our research team, uh, we decided to focus our first studies on blogs. Uh, blogs are considered a type of social media. Uh, they are web-based personal journals with dated entries, which we call posts, and they are displayed, uh, displayed in reverse chronological order. Uh, there's usually uh, features uh, like archives uh, so that posts are uh, easily traceable which is different from other kind of social media, such as Twitter or Facebook, uh, in which it's difficult to uh, trace back information that could have been posted several days or months ago. Uh, some of the advantages uh, of blogs and also of uh, other types of social media, social media is the bi-directional exchange and increased social support that it can provide. Uh, social support has been shown as a, uh, one of the determinants of uh, a successful behavior change intervention. Um, they also can reach a diverse and large uh, demographic group. They are easily accessible. Um, they are mostly low cost and um, they have a durable communication. There are some gaps uh, in the literature, so although blogs are increasingly being used by health professionals, but also by dietitians uh, to share information, promote healthy behaviors, to educate the population, and also to interact with the population and uh, their colleagues. Uh, we lack empirical evidence on how to design, evaluate, and implement social media delivered behavior change interventions. Uh, we, have, we also lack um, data on the uh, impact, the effectiveness, the efficacy of these interventions to truly uh, improve behaviors. So when we started uh, this research program, I first submitted a uh, RCT uh, proposal to CIHR, and they said, well, nobody ever did such a study, so maybe it's a little bit too soon to start with the RCT. So we put that project on hold and we submitted a, a, a proposal to uh, one of the KT Canada uh, seed uh, funding competition a couple of years ago. And this proposal was for this study that was uh, published um, two years ago in GMIR, uh, which aimed to explore women's beliefs and perceptions about LT eating blocks. So we had uh, women, uh, internet users living in the Quebec City metropolitan area, uh, consuming less than uh, five portions of fruits and vegetables per day um, to participate in our study. So uh, the first part of the study was uh, interview, uh, consisted of individual interviews. Um, and during these interviews, uh, women explored uh, four existing healthy eating blogs that were written in French by registered dietitians. So that first part, I will not discuss the results uh, of this first uh, part of the study tour uh, in, in detail, but it aimed mostly um, to um, show women uh, what we were talking about. So they would have all uh, uh, the same basis for discussion in the next part of that study, which were uh, focus groups. So these women, after um, meeting one of the research team member uh, in, individual, in individual interviews, participated in a focus group two to four weeks later. Uh, and these focus groups um, were conducted uh, in which women were grouped by age and also by their use of social media. 
Um, to develop the moderator's guide, we use a theory of planned behavior. Uh, and so we ask uh, women questions about their attitudes, subjective norms, and perceived behavioral control related to the use of a blog to improve their dietary behavior. So 33 women participated to this uh, study, this qualitative study. Um, they were age uh, 44 years old, as I mean, but we had people ranging from 18 years old to uh, almost 70 years old, if I remember correctly. Um, we also uh, had women who were um, who had either college or um, university education, most of them. Um, and also uh, almost uh, half of them, a little bit less than half of them had a family income of uh, over $50,000. Um, so all of the women were internet users, but, uh, and they had a different frequency of using the internet, um, but only 76% well, of them read a blog before entering the study. 64% uh, of those who had read a blog before uh, were uh, familiar, familiar with nutrition blogs. 72% uh, had uh, read comments on blogs before, and only 8% of them commented on a blog uh, before entering the study. So uh, the results of this first, um, this first part of the study um, showed us that uh, the advantages that were perceived by uh, these women was that uh, blogs provided useful recipes, ideas, and what they liked is that these ideas uh, were coming from credible sources of information because uh, each of the blogs that we showed them were uh, written by registered dietitians and also really appreciated uh, the fact that it uh, could allow interaction with the dietitian. Uh, among the disadvantages, uh, that were um, discussed by uh, women. Uh, they said that it would increase the time spent on the internet, and some of them uh, said that it, it could induce feeling of guilt if the recommendations seen on the blog were not uh, were not followed. In terms of subjective norms, um, people um, that was a tricky question because uh, women did not perceive that using a blog to improve their dietary behaviors was something that was uh, the business of anything of anyone else than the, themselves. But they still responded to our question, and people who would approve their use of the blog were family, colleagues, and friends, and uh, those who, would, who could disapprove were uh, family. So for example, if uh, the blog would uh, change their dietary uh, behaviors and habits, then maybe some of the family members would not be happy about it. And uh, they mentioned doctors because some of them had had uh, experiences before of talking to their doctors about uh, websites that they had consulted for their health, and they had had a um, negative uh, interaction with their doctors about, uh, about that. Among the facilitators, uh, women mentioned having visually attractive blogs. And um, this is in line with uh, some information that were published in a systematic review uh, in which uh, people thought that uh, discussion boards were not seen as something uh, interesting to interact on because it was not visually attractive. So the women uh, in our study mentioned that it was an important point. Uh, they said that uh, receiving an email notification about the new posts that were published would have been uh, interesting to facilitate their use of the blog, and they also wanted to find information, uh, new information on a regular basis. And we asked them further, what is a regular basis for you? And so um, twice a week was seen as too too much because they, they, they thought they were too busy to go on the blog twice a week, and then twice, uh, once every two weeks was seen as being uh, not enough, and so um, the, the, there was a consensus uh, among women that once a week was the ideal um, frequency of posting uh, on the blog. Among the barriers, we uh, could see too much text, so people are uh, used to having very short in, uh, uh, sentences, information uh, on social media, so that was something that could have been a barrier for them. Uh, they didn't like when they were uh, publicities on the blog, and uh, also the lack of time could be uh, a barrier. So 
So other important things that came out from that first study was that uh, women um, thought that among the interesting characteristics of blogs in nutrition were the recipes, the hyperlinks that could complete the information they would receive, and also references, which were important to them. Um, also, two important things that came out of the focus group were that um, they really appreciated the possible interaction between uh, blog readers and dietitian bloggers. And as it could create a sense of proximity and also connection uh, helpful for improving their, uh, their diet. Uh, and also they preferred when uh, dietitian bloggers used a narrative approach. So when they use uh, posts uh, written at the first person, uh, when they uh, related personal experiences such as uh, recipe failures, et cetera, uh, and that was preferred to a non-narrative approach so when dietitians would use a more uh, expert advice. So this first study allowed us to identify perceptions about potential blog users, of potential blog users about the use of LT thing blogs to improve their dietary habits. Um, they also mentioned other preferred characteristics in terms of uh, visual features, um, and uh, they proved very uh, useful to create our own experimental blog. So now we had the blog, but what about the uh, behavioral nutrition intervention that could be delivered through it? So how could we translate uh, an intervention that's usually given face-to-face -face and uh, translate it so that it could be used uh, in a social uh, media intervention? So the next two slides will be presented by Audrey Antma, which uh, Students in uh, in my team, um, and she was part of uh, our team when we developed uh, the behavioral intervention of our study. Thank you, Sophie. So, uh, our as the, as you said, the next step was to develop the dietary intervention that we were going to de deliver through the blog, because we currently know that behavior change interventions should draw on effective theory theories to increase their effectiveness, uh, we use the intervention mapping protocol to develop an evidence-informed blog to uh, promote healthy eating among French-Canadian women. Briefly, the intervention mapping protocol is a, a planning, uh, is a framework to develop uh, evidence-based health intervention. It guides the selection of relevant theories to uh, in increase the likelihood of effectiveness to change health behaviors. So, here is an overview of the first four steps of the six steps of the intervention mapping protocol that we did for, in our team. So as the first step uh, was to conduct a needs assessment. So uh, we uh, first uh, did a literature search on psychological determinants of vegetables and fruit intakes in adults. And we conducted a pre preliminary focus group study as uh, Sophie just described. The second step was to uh, identify the uh, objectives of our dietary intervention. And the step number three was to select theory-based intervention methods. And as a step four was to organize everything into an intervention. So we uh, created, for instance, the sequence of the blog, we designed the blog, and we uh, wrote the publication, the blog publication, and we created the recipes that we were going to include in every uh, blog post. So now I will uh, describe uh, those uh, steps. So step one was uh, really well explained by Sophie with our needs assessment. So the step two was to identify our objectives. So the main behavioral objective of our intervention was to increase the daily intakes of vegetables and fruits of French Canadian women. We then subdivided the, this main objective into six performance objectives. These objectives were inspired mostly by the Health Canada Eat Well campaign and the health recommendation of the World Health Organization. So here are those uh, objectives in chronological order of appearance on the blog. So first uh, was to have vegetables and fruits with every meal. For that, we defined the concept of the Canadian Eat Well plate. The second objective was to plan adequately vegetables and fruit uh, for chase and meal preparation. Uh, three was to make healthy food choices at the grocery store. And for that, we, uh, for instance, pr um, provided more knowledge onto, uh, onto how to efficiently 
uh, understand and use nutrition food labels. Uh, four was to know economic options to increase daily intakes of vegetables and fruits. Five, to increase the daily intakes of vegetables and fruits of the home family. So for example, um, how, can we, how could the study participants express more positive uh, attitude towards involving children in the preparation of family meals? And six was uh, to make healthy uh, substitutions in recipes. For step three, we, um, based on our literature search, we uh, found that the most consistent psychological determinant that predicted the consumption and the intention to consume vegetables and fruits in adults were knowledge, beliefs about consequences, beliefs about the capabilities, uh, intention and goals, social influences, and skills. So we wanted to target those determinants in our intervention. And to do so, we selected relevant behavior change techniques from the taxonomy developed by Miki and Collaborator. And we selected the techniques that were applicable for the context of an online dietary intervention transmitted uh, through a blog. Here are some examples of the techniques that we selected for two of uh, the determinants that we targeted in our intervention. And you can see some examples of, on how we uh, applied those techniques to our blog. So first for knowledge, we use uh, two techniques. So first, uh, information about health consequences. So the use of the blog allowed the dietitian blogger to uh, provide knowledge on the health benefits of including more uh, vegetables and fruits in their uh, diet. And the dietitian blogger for the second uh, technique could provide positive feedback on study participants' behaviors through the comments function of uh, the blog. Now for beliefs about consequences, we use uh, mostly three techniques. So first, uh, the dietitian blogger provided knowledge on the emotional, uh, on uh, the advantages, I'm sorry, for, of consuming vegetables and fruits every day. And she shared her real life examples on, on how this behavior improved, for instance, her quality of life. And for the technique, uh, information about social and environmental consequences, the dietitian blogger provided knowledge on uh, the advantages, for example, of efficient meal planning and how this could reduce meal planning time and food expenses. And for the last technique, the dietitian blogger shared uh, her own experience in comparing her reason for wanting to, so the pros, and not wanting to, the cons, to include, for instance, children in the pre preparation of family meals. And now for step four, to organize everything into an intervention program, we developed a six-month intervention uh, in which we address uh, one performance objective per month in weekly blog posts uh, that are written in a narrative approach by a registered dietitian. So we published a total of 26 posts in our intervention. Based on the results of the pilot of the focus group study that Sophie just described, uh, we included a step-by-step -step recipe uh, featuring vegetables and fruits in every uh, blog publication. Uh, for the most, uh, now the technical part, the blog was developed on the self-hosting blogging platform WordPress.org, and we uh, collaborated closely with the web designers at Laval University. Uh, to, to do so and to respect the uh, visual and the design preferences of the social uh, media users uh, that were uh, identified in our uh, previous uh, focus group study. And lastly and briefly, the last two steps of the intervention mapping protocol that were conducted are uh, for step five, to plan for the adoption of the blog. So we want to know if the uh, Behavioral nutrition inter uh, intervention that is delivered through a blog is feasible. So Sophie will present next the result of a pilot study that was conducted. And lastly, the step six of the intervention mapping protocol is to plan for the adoption of the blog. So a large randomized control trial is on the way to evaluate the impact of the blog that we created on the dietary and food related behaviors of women. Thank you, Audrey-Anne. Um, so as Audrey-Anne mentioned, uh, the next step of our uh, program was 
to uh, do a pilot study, which uh, was funded by CIHR this time, uh, to evaluate the feasibility uh, of using an evidence-informed uh, health eating blog, mm -hmm. promoting the consumption of fruit and vegetables among women. And that was prior to undertaking our full RCT. Um, so we had a couple of feasibility criteria, such as compliance rates, um, a questionnaire uh, measure that questionnaires completed, uh, and also attendance rate for in-person appointments. Uh, we also had a criteria for um, participation rate, which was measured by uh, participants' uh, access uh, to uh, the blog post. And then we also had a criteria for um, attrition rate. So we included women uh, age 18 years and older um, from the Quebec City area. Uh, they all had uh, internet access, and also they were consuming less than five servings of fruit and vegetables per day. Uh, they were randomized to either the healthy eating blood group or to the control group. So we had 40 women in each of the groups. This is the framework of our study. So uh, as uh, Adrian mentioned, it was conducted over uh, six months. So participants would come to the research center uh, at the beginning and also at the end uh, of the study uh, to complete, uh, well, first of all, the consent form and also to um, allow us to um, take anthropometric measurements. And they then completed questionnaires. Uh, they wouldn't have had to uh, come to the research center to complete them, but since they were already there for uh, anthropometric measurements, um, they, they, they completed them on site. But all of our questions are web-based. Um, the Institute of Nutrition and Functional Food have a um, clinical web portal on which all of the questionnaires that we use in our clinical study, uh, they can be accessed by our participants uh, on site, but also uh, from their um, own computer um, at home. We also had a monthly questionnaire for that pilot study uh, in which we asked participants uh, if the, the, the information was clear uh, that questions uh, delivered through uh, the blog, if it was useful for them. Um, and so uh, once every month they received also that questionnaire that they completed uh, online on our clinical web portal. Uh, following the intervention, women also came back, um, of, well, women uh, that were included in the uh, intervention group, they came back for a focus group uh, to measure uh, accessibility of our intervention. So this is what our experimental blog looks like. Um, as you can see, um, we see the, the picture of the blogger, which is uh, Maria Caplet, who is uh, the uh, master's student who uh, coordinated uh, and worked on the study. Um, so there was a recipe, as Adrian said, in each and every post, and there was also uh, a text that accompanied it. Uh, here you can only see a couple lines, but uh, it was uh, a little bit more uh, longer than that. So for that pilot study, um, yeah, we had 80 participants, 40 in each group. Um, and there was no difference in uh, age, ethnicity, education, completed family income, body mass index, or uh, fruit and vegetable daily consumption uh, between the intervention group and the control group. Uh, in terms of compliance and attrition, uh, we had two participants uh, who dropped out of the study. They were both in the intervention group, uh, but their decision to drop out was uh, didn't have anything to do with the study. So, uh, for example, death in the family, et cetera. Uh, all of the participants that were left, so 78 persons, uh, came to their in-person appointment at INAP. They also all completed uh, the pre- and post-intervention questionnaires. And as you saw in our framework, there were a couple of these uh, questionnaires, not only one or two. Uh, and also, the 96% uh, of them completed the monthly questionnaire. When we conducted the focus group, they mentioned that this questionnaire was a little bit too much for them uh, to complete every month, uh, and it's, it's not something that they, they really enjoy uh, doing during the study. In terms of participation, um, most of the blog posts were um, accessed by a large proportion of our participants. So you can see on the x-axis, 
uh, the, the, each of the polls. And then on the y-axis, uh, the percentage of participants who accept each blog post. Um, there's only uh, 37 uh, women uh, uh, among which we could uh, measure uh, participation because one of the women had installed a um, firewall on her computer. And so we could not see when she would log uh, onto, the, onto the blog. Uh, and so um, if a participant did not um, log onto the blog for two consecutive weeks, we would send them a reminder. And so that woman said, well, yeah, I saw the, the last two posts. And so we realized that we could not uh, grab her um, statistics by uh, Google Analytics and uh, also the, the statistics uh, on uh, WordPress. Um, we can also see on that slide that um, the number of blog posts that were accessed or the percentage of participants accessing uh, each blog post did not really uh, uh, decrease uh, over uh, the six-month intervention. Uh, one surprise that we had was that, uh, a nice surprise, that uh, a lot of participants commented on the blog. Uh, in real life, if you look at uh, blogs by dietitians, um, it takes some time uh, and it takes a superstar blogger uh, to have several comments uh, on their blog. And so we were a bit surprised by uh, the, the, the enthusiasm of our participants. And so for each post, we had between um, about 15 and 20 comments for each post that were published on the blog. And we really wanted to respond to each of these comments uh, to show participants that all of their comments were, were valued. Uh, there were also some interactions between participants, but most of the interactions were between the blogger and uh, participants. So for our uh, pilot study, so all of our uh, feasibility criteria were met. So we uh, started uh, recently a larger scale RCT using the same methodology. Uh, so this study is ongoing, and it's uh, the uh, study of uh, Audrey-Anne for a PhD study. So uh, it will be the first to evaluate the impact of a blog-delivered uh, via viral change intervention in nutrition on women dietary and food-related behaviors. Um, of course, uh, the pilot study was not um, powered to detect differences necessarily uh, in uh, fruit and vegetable consumption of our participants, but we did see uh, in our sample, an increase of uh, almost two portions of fruits and vegetables per day in the intervention group. So we uh, look forward to see what uh, the results will be in the full uh, RCT. So given that dietitians often use many social media channels, we will broaden the scope of our research program beyond blogs uh, and work also more closely with knowledge users in the field of dietetic practice uh, in our next project. Uh, this first, um, one of the first steps that we took is that we, um, we were recently funded by the Canadian Foundation of Dietetic Research for a scoping review on the uses, users, and impact of social media and dietetic practice. And um, we also have two uh, knowledge users on our team, so uh, someone from um, the public health sector, and uh, someone also from a professional organization um, working with dietitians. So despite the widespread use of social media by dietitians, much remains unknown about their impact on dietary behaviors. Um, and so a lot of questions remain, such as what type of social media is more effective? Also, what is a meaningful engagement for participants? So uh, if a participant does not comment on a blog, does it have an impact on their, uh, on their behavior? Uh, are those who are more involved have more um, important impact on their dietary behaviors? So we'll see that in um, future studies. Uh, is it um, more effective to have simple messages? So such messages could be trans, uh, transferred through Twitter or Facebook or more complex interventions such as the one we're conducting uh, with our blog. Uh, also looking, uh, we would like to look at the, the best target population um, and also in which context of, the, of dietetic practice 
uh, should be uh, be used. So dietitians in private practice, clinical practice, or uh, public health practice. So um, I would like to thank uh, our team uh, who worked on uh, the projects um, I briefly discussed today. So the co-investigators, our research coordinator, Annie Lapointe, the graduate students who worked on this project, and uh, we also had an undergraduate student who worked several summers with us uh, on the project. So I thank you, and uh, we will be happy to take questions. Yes, are you there? Yes, we, we changed to the phone and now we hear you. Sorry, go yes. ahead. <laughs> okay, so okay. sorry, we didn't realize that you um, finished because we lost audio for a little bit and we're trying to deal with that. So. Sorry we missed the end of the presentation, but we'll go ahead and do questions now. Um, any questions from Dalhousie? No, thank you for that great presentation. Any questions from Queens? Oh, hello. Yeah, hi, Gail, sorry. Um, I, I just I, look. We had very poor quality audio, so we might have missed this. But we were wondering what the control group was for the pilot um, RCT, and if that has changed when moving to the full scale randomised trial. Yeah, uh, good question. The control was a delayed, con kind of a delayed condition. So during the study, uh, all they did was complete the same questionnaire that the ones. Uh, the participants in the intervention group, and then following the intervention, we gave them access to the blog. Um, of course, they could not. Um, the, the the comment section was uh, was not activated, uh, but they could see all the posts, and they could, uh, if they wanted, uh, print them. So that was the control uh, condition, and we did not change that for the the ongoing study. Uh, we have another study that we're thinking about that uh, would probably be different, so uh, we would have interventions in both groups, um, but one of the groups would be a web, uh, a static website, and the other one would be a, a blog so that we could really assess the impact uh, of the blog. Any other questions from Queen? No, thanks. Thanks, Gail. Okay. Any questions from Ottawa? No. Okay. So, you could, if, Ottawa, if you have any questions later on, feel free to interrupt or send me uh, a chat. Um, McMaster has told me they don't have any questions. So any questions from the Jeraz Center? Uh, where? Where? Jeraz Center. I have a chat of questions from the University of uh, Manitoba. If they thought I could just read out for them. Do you think it would be useful to interview uh, or um, assess, sorry, my chat just, or assess women who have changed health behaviors to determine how social media influence their behavior change? Yes, that would be, uh, of course, very interesting. Um, we will try to. Um, did she mean with, or did he mean with within our studies or, or in another study? Okay, great. Um, any questions from Edmonton, U of A? Nope, no questions here. Thanks. 
Any questions from ICRH? Hi, yeah, that was a great presentation. Uh, I'm not sure if I missed it, but I'm just wondering um, how you, or if you measure change in fruit and vegetable consumption after uh, the uh, finishing the intervention in the pilot study. Uh, yes, we measured it. Uh, maybe we didn't have necessarily the power to do it, but we uh, measured it and we were very curious. And so uh, there was a change in 1.78 if I remember correctly, uh, in terms of uh, fruit and vegetable portion. So the, the intervention group that uh, was on the blog consumed on average uh, 1.78 portions more fruit and vegetables compared to the control group. And it was statistically significant. Per day. Yep, per day. Mm -hmm. per day. Great, thanks. Any other questions from uh, oh, one more site, Western Academic Pediatrics, any questions? You see? Yes, we again. Okay. Yes, there is a question at Saval. Great, hey, I was going to come to you guys last, so go ahead, Zoe. Okay. <laughs> is it I, I go ahead. Okay. Hey, we thank you very much. Uh, we are very excited because uh, this is of interest to us. But, uh, my questions are going to be a bit more theoretically um, directed. So what's the real difference between a blog and, and what I understood what's happening here than activating a community of practice? Because would the blog itself be like the intervention? Because you mentioned that it was felt very important to engage with the, the, the intervention harm and women could post some uh, a, a post, and then you would, you know, uh, acknowledge this. So you kind of activated the group, and uh, so so it's a bit of a, I don't know, like is this like renaming from two for two o seventeen because it's technology driven, something which is a community of practice, you know, the blog mm -hmm. itself. So what are what are what we're observing? strictly align with what is a blog that you very well define with activating a community of practice, because there's some systematic review on this, and people have said community of practice are an intervention in itself. So that's mm -hmm. uh, my first theory-oriented question. And my second one is I, I was wondering if the fact that you, uh, I don't know if you said it uh, clearly to the intervention uh, harm, that the blogger was a dietitian. Yes if it would have made a difference, because when you look at what you've done qualitatively, with also the cystic review, never was in the social norm the dietitian, the dietitian in, identified as a person of importance. Mm -hmm. So it was friends, colleagues, like people like me almost. Mm -hmm. So maybe the role belief, like people like me would have been interested to assess, but why did you feel that you needed to have a dietitian or the person could have been not a dietitian? So those are two seriously uh, yeah. directed questions. Uh, the first question, um, I see it differently than a community of practice in which, for example, you would have dietitians working on a, uh, on a topic that is of interest to them, whereas in the blog that we use, it really it was an intervention that could have been an in-person intervention in terms of content. But the blog allowed for the, the dietitian to be the main blogger and then the participants were in the comment section. They were interacting in the comment section. So in the community of practice, everybody is, from my understanding, they're all participating to the same level Maybe there's someone who's moderating. Can you? My, my feeling is that probably if the blog continued, you could probably get to being a community of practice because then there would be more interactions between the members consulting the blog. Mm -hmm. But what you said was that most people tend to interact on a one-to-one -one basis yeah. with the blogger. And so that doesn't really fit mm -hmm. what a community of practice would be about. Usually it's, you get a lot of peer support yeah. through a community of practice. But if you kept the, the, the blog online for longer, probably the membership would be stable and there could be people getting to know each other over time. Yeah, 
And when we conducted, um, after the pilot study, we had uh, focus groups also, and women said that after six months at the end of the intervention, they were just beginning, you know, to kind of wanting to interact with yeah. one another. Um, so um, probably our next studies will be uh, more than six months. Uh, for the, the other question. The other question was that, <clears throat> I don't know if this was specified, but you specified it to us that the blogger, the oh, one yeah. running the, the blog was a dietitian. Mm -hmm. But from a theoretical point of view, both in your qualitative studies and in the statistic yep. review, as a social norm, the dietitian or clinician does not appear. Yeah. But could that be in like a fake mm -hmm. woman um, saying me as a person, narrates, you know, yeah. so why did you make it? Well, first, I think that probably they did not mention the dietitian in the, the, the first qualitative study as being someone important to them, because not a lot of people have access to a dietitian. So there's mm -hmm. less than 3,000 dietitians in the province of Quebec, and even more so for health promotion and disease prevention, there's a lot less access to these professionals. So for acute diseases, they have but someone who would just like to uh, improve their overall diet, it's more difficult, so probably they didn't have the sense that they could yeah, yeah. have access easily. Um, and also, the, our research program really wants to um, study social media as a possibility or as a strategy that could be used by dietitians to uh, connect with the population or potential patients. And there, there are a lot of blogs, nutrition blogs, that are written by lay people. Exactly. Uh, some studies show that um, they, they display, um, some of them, dangerous information um, that are not evidence-based. Uh, so uh, we really wanted people to feel confident and also to ask questions, but it could be another study. <laughs> but that's it, because that, the other study would be in that, that quite kind of a catch-22, like uh, it's a catch-22 is to compare telling bloggers that this blog is run by a dietitian versus by a colleague or a friend or someone like me, mm -hmm. and see if you, had, if you would have a similar impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I mean, uh, but uh, because mm -hmm. from a theory point of view, mm -hmm. clinicians, except doctors, from a negative perspective, mm -hmm. will not name. Yeah. Um, Audrey Anne uh, conducted her master's study uh, uh, she looked at blogs that were either written by dietitians well, or non dietitians and then she compared the nutritional well, information. Um, but she only looked at vegetarian focused yeah. blogs mm -hmm. and there weren't a lot of differences in the, the nutritional information of the recipes that were posted. So is it because we looked specifically at vegetarian focused blogs uh, in which lay people have a strong interest in nutrition so they can, you know, provide some information. Okay, if you want to complete that. Uh, you said it well, <laughs> yeah. They could be more interested, interesting in healthy eating so they could read more and get more knowledge on their own even though they don't have an academic nutrition background. And I, I would like to add also that for social influences, we use the uh, behavior change techniques uh, modeling. So the dietitian blogger, she was, uh, she could, um, be a role model for the study participants. And I think that uh, because we use a narrative approach as uh, in line with our results, uh, she could be more, um, I don't know how to say that, but grounded and people could relate to, the, to, to, the, to her in, and not an expert, uh, not a, and she could not be seen as an expert. Because the only difference that we have seen, but again, it could have been something that needs to be pre taught is actually be a dietitian who's a blogger, but not say it. Mm -hmm. So basically yeah. my question is, did you say it that she was also a dietitian? Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. So maybe what I'm saying is that maybe you did not need to say it. Uh, well, yeah, we would have seen it. But you just said, hi, yeah. uh, Sophie, but you don't say I'm a... Mm -hmm. But one of the reasons why we mentioned it was that in our qualitative study, this was something that uh, participants had mentioned as being important yeah. to see the credentials of uh, okay. the blogger. Okay. So it was not but, a social norm, but it was a credential yeah. Yeah. approved mm -hmm. by. Yeah. yeah, so I, I have a question, and I apologize if I missed it, but 
did you look into whether who is it that bought the groceries, like who bought the food in the household, and who cooks in the household? Did yeah. you take into consideration that? Yes, uh, it was a part of our inclusion criteria. So the the women included needed to be uh, mostly responsible for these tasks in the family. Okay. Yes, it could be shared with uh, with the conjoint husband or uh, okay. partner, but they, they needed to be uh, uh, greatly yeah. involved. Yeah, at least fifty percent of the okay. time. Okay, and so and it's the same inclusion criteria for the larger trial yeah. as well. Yep. Okay, and what do you think would happen if you showed the blog to people who were not the main cooks in the family? Like, how do you think? accessible the change would be mm -hmm. in their behaviors if it wasn't or if it's men that were the ones consulting the blog that would be interesting and we, we this is something that we'd like to study eventually um, we started with women because when we looked at the literature and also uh, surveys about bloggers and uh, blog readers most nutrition bloggers are women, mm -hmm. and most of their readership is also women, so we wanted to start with what's more available um, in, re in the real world. Um, and also because often blog readers, no matter what the topic, they identify with the blogger, and so mm -hmm. if they don't identify, they will look at another blog. Mm -hmm. But this would be something interesting to look at, either people who are not involved in preparing food but also with men, mm -hmm. uh, should we use different strategies, different mm -hmm. techniques, so that it would be uh, probably because you do not translate information the same way. I would, uh, and I would think that the, the, the barriers to healthy eating are not the same when you don't mm -hmm. buy your own food, or yeah. if you're not the main cook, you're depending on someone else. Mm -hmm. So there's, I think you guys are, are starting with a group that's more favorable to change or mm -hmm. to be less barriers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And eventually, yeah, we'll do more. Uh, pragmatic studies in the real world. This one, where the, the first studies are more controlled because we really want to see the efficacy. Yeah. No. Hi, Sophie. I have a chatted um, question from Patrick Archambault. Mm -hmm. um, he thanks you for a great presentation and wants to know if you had any thoughts about using the, uh, uh, TDF instead of um, theory plan behavior to determine the theory-based determinants of your IM. Using what instead of the theory of plan behavior? Theoretical domain framework, TDF. Uh, yes, that, uh, it is actually what we uh, use. I, I did not go into those details, but uh, we, um, okay, uh, how can I structure this? This is <laughs> just mentioned that the TPB was uh, used for the qualitative study. And then I can leave Adrian respond about the, the, the pilot study and also the RCT. Yes, so we um, uh, did the literature search, and based on the determinants that predicted the consumption of vegetables and fruits, um, we uh, identified the, uh, the, the, the appropriate uh, behavior change techniques, but uh, our determinants were uh, um, a priori uh, classified by the theoretical domains of the theoretical domain framework. That's why I I said the least about consequences, that is uh, the attitude. Is that, is, that, uh, is that more clear? I haven't heard any other chats from them, so I'm going to assume it's clear, and if not, perhaps. Do you hear me now? I was trying to speak, but uh, do you hear me now? Okay, well, it, it is a bit clearer, clearer, but I, from what I understand is that the qualitative part, you use the theoretical, the, the, the TPB, but for the uh, pilot study, you determine new determinants with the TDF? That, that's not clear to me. Okay, uh, with the qualitative study, we wanted uh, to know what would make them use the blog, whereas in the pilot study, uh, our behavior was uh, the um, consumption of fruit and vegetables. So we had different behaviors, and that's why we didn't use the same um, the same theory. Yeah. And we selected the techniques that were uh, that could target the determinants, the theoretical domains actually, that could uh, pre increase their intakes of vegetables and fruits. And we did use the intervention mapping protocol because it's a six step, 
And the theoretical do domain framework, it uh, goes into step three where we selected the, the theory-based technique. So what, from, my, from what I understand is that you use the, th the, the um, TPB to identify the determinants, but then you use the theoretical domains framework to try to map the interventions that would be theoretically based uh, to act on the determinants that you d that you had found or identified with the TPB. Actually, the determinants that uh, we identify for our interventions that aim to change the behavior of vegetables and fruit consumption were based on a literature uh, systematic review based on uh, conducted by Guillaume and collaborateurs. So, uh, and so based on observational studies, the most consistent we use those determinants to uh, plan our intervention. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Very, very good presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. So if anyone has any last minute uh, questions, please feel free to ask them now. Okay, then if not, I'll say thank you to both of you. Please make sure to complete uh, your evaluation forms, either the paper forms or I will be sending a online evaluation shortly after the session this afternoon. And um, next month is on February 9th with uh, Robin Urquhart. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.